So the session for today on our quantum computing and quantum simulation webinars will be by our own Mark Antoine, or Mark, uh, who's a postdoc in my group. Uh, he will talk about uh, quantum optimization type of approaches, variational, a new variational algorithm that we came up with to um, tackle a, a, a very basic problem in implementing quantum optimization algorithms in hardware. Most of the work so far um, required as many qubits as variables in your original classical um, problem. So if you have 10,000 variables, which is roughly where um, some of the logistics or optimization problems nowadays are, you need 10,000 qubits. This is out of reach. So we spent the last year, maybe more than the last year, um, driven by Mark and Ben. Um, ben is a PhD student in the group, is a joint work between the two of them, and the rest of us are also, some of us are also involved. To come up with a qubit efficient sim, we want to tell you today that might actually scale down these requirements and make things a bit more close to what can be done. So without further ado, let me pass uh, the floor to Mark. And as usual, uh, please put your questions on the chat. And at the end, we're gonna have a discussion as well. Um, and you know, you can maybe even open your mic at that stage. Mark. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you for everybody, uh, to everybody for being here. Okay, so as Dimitri already said, uh, I will be presenting uh, some of the explore exploration ideas that we've been having in the last uh, few months recently, uh, looking at, at these variational uh, algorithm for, for uh, the near-term quantum devices. Uh, we've been focusing more on the optimization problems, how to solve optimization problems, and more precisely, how can we do it by cutting down significantly the number of qubits. Uh, so before uh, I jump right into it, let me find my colleagues. So I'm in the group of Dimitri and Gilekis, obviously, at the CQT. So we are uh, two postdocs for the moment, Jawad and I. Uh, Daniel is, is uh, joining uh, soon. Uh, we have three PhD students uh, in Bengi, Benjamin, and Supanut, and we have two uh, RA uh, research assistants. So for this work, I want to have a, give you a special specific shout out to Benjamin, who is a PhD, who did a lot of the work. So Benjamin and I are the two main investigators in this, this uh, project. Uh, so let me first you know, uh, introduce properly what is the problem that we're going to be solving. So this is the well-known uh, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem, or for short, Kubo. So it's a combinatorial problem that is NPR to find the exact solution. It has a very simple mathematical form, which is to minimize or maximize this quadratic expression here, x. Okay, so x here is a vector of binary variables. So each classical variables are zero and ones. And the goal here is to find what is the series, what is this bit string that minimizes this, this expression. And A is the matrix that defines the problem in N. So the reason why it's so popular is that it kind of describes many, many real world problems. So a lot of, of these problems can be mapped on this form. So for example, you have the facility allocation, which could be something like uh, whether I should build a factory or not in a site given the surrounding uh, resources, transaction settlement, so many, many different uh, uh, examples. So for this work, we're gonna, we're gonna take a more abstract uh, approach to it. So we're going to map every uh, Kubo problem on the graph. Okay, so for example, here every classical variable zero and ones in my problem would be represented by a node, so these blue dots, and those lines, the edges, uh, will represent zero mm -hmm. element in A matrix. So for example, a dense matrix where like all the elements are non-zero uh, would be mapped on the complete graph where you have all the lines. And in, in contrast, if you have like a sparse matrix with a lot of zero, then you end up with this graph uh, where only few edges are present. So here I give a particular example of what is known as the tree regular max cut problem, this matrix. The tree regular stand for the fact that each node has uh, connects to, to three edges. So this is kind of the dense versus sparse matrix A that we'll be looking at. 
So just to give you an idea, uh, like Dimitri already said, the sizes that, that you know, real world problem deals with can go up to 10,000 bi uh, binary variables. And this is very challenging to find the exact solution and to solve uh, properly. So how quantum mechanics can help for that? I mean, I'm assuming that many of you already know the answer, but for completeness, I'm gonna walk to you through it. So the idea is that uh, in the general approaches, you map every single classical variable on a single qubit, okay? So each your classical variable becomes qubit, and if you do that, your quantum state can be written as a superposition, inner superposition of all the possible classical solutions. So here, the n symbol of x represents all the two to the nc, nc being the number of classical uh, variable, two to the nc possible solution. This is the n symbol of x, and the, the quantum state x would be the every every uh, uh, computational basis states of my qubit. So, for example, if I measure my qubits along z, I would get a, a bit string out zero, 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 and ones, and every possible solution represent a cool possible solution. So the idea is that, uh, in principle, quantum mechanics can allow us to to test all these classical solutions at the same time. So this in parallelism is what drives uh, people to look into quantum mechanics to solve these optimization problems. But this is not always easy to do. So the way to, to I mean, so this question is kind of goes down to saying like, how can I make sure that I efficiently search my Hilbert space and I find the exact solution that represent uh, uh, the, the solution of the Kubo problem. So the trick is that for this encoding, you can map the Kubo problem on an Ising spin chain. So here, sigmas are my poly matrices, and my a, i, j are my elements of my matrix, Kubo matrix that represent the problem. So I can, I can always map my Kubo problem on that, and the ground state of this Hamiltonian would be like a single basis state that will represent the best solution of my problem. So if I'm able to, to implement this Hamiltonian on my quantum hardware, so if I can evolve my quantum state under this dynamic, what it does is that it kind of generate this, this energy landscape in my, my uh, Hilbert space. And now I can use all sorts of tricks and protocols uh, to navigate through this, this uh, Hilbert space efficiently. And all these tricks, possible tricks, can be kind of summed up under what is known as quantum annealing. So these are different uh, techniques. So here is one of the very simple example that you would do. Uh, uh, you could implement a very slow protocol where you start with a different Hamiltonian, which would be AHB, which would represent like an effective a strong magnetic field along X so that you start with all your spin along X and then you just slowly change your Hamiltonian towards H Ising. And if you do that, you can ensure that you follow the, the region of the lowest energy until you reach the, the, the state. Okay, so that's a very schematic thing. You can think of, of those energy landscape to change in time, but that kind of give the rough idea. So adiabatic theorem ensures you that if you go slow enough, for example, in this protocol, you will end up in the ground state of your Hamiltonian H Ising, which represents the exact solution of the Kubo problem. Uh, so this requires very long protocol usually, uh, especially if the number of, of variable uh, increases, the gap decreases and you need to go slower and slower. And also you need to implement this H Ising on your quantum hardware, which can be very challenging uh, given that it can be an all to all coupling, for example. So what you need to do for, to implement those protocols do not yet fit what we have now in terms of, of uh, quantum resources. Uh, so for the moment example, what we call the noisy intermediate scale quantum devices or NISC for short, are like the current uh, generation and, and what we expect to be the next few generations of quantum hardware. And uh, in those we have finite coherence time, coherence time, so it's difficult to implement long adiabatic uh, approaches. We have finite gate fidelity and connectivity between the qubit, so it can be very challenging to implement this H Ising. And we have Mark, just a sheer limited number of amount of qubit. Yeah. Mark, um, there's a little bit of a lag every now and then on your uploading. Maybe off the video for a little bit and see how okay. it goes. We miss you every now and then. Not too bad, but okay. let me see how it goes later. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, and, and yeah, we just have also a sheer limited amount of qubits. So even though we could implement everything perfectly, uh, you know, we, like with the few tens of qubit, we could only uh, 
solve like a, a toy models, like smaller models. So here it's not meant to be an exhaustive list. I'm just giving a few examples of what are, what are the platforms that are available right now. How do we solve that? How do we go around with like knowing that we have a limited uh, quantum resources? So one of the paradigms that I've been uh, gather, gathering a lot of interest so far, uh, so far is, is those versional quantum algorithms. So given the fact that we have a limited, uh, we have limitation in terms of, of what we can implement, what we do is that the unitary evolution that generate my state before it was this, maybe this, this quantum annealing protocols, now we have limitation, it, it cannot be extremely uh, deep and, and also we have a limited amount of control on it. So what we do to balance it is that we use the versional protocol, a versional uh, uh, approach. Okay? So the idea is that we have an input state it will evolve under this, this quantum ANZAS that is known as quantum ANZAS, this unitary evolution. We're going to measure the output, you know, and uh, we're going to make a series of measurements on the state. We're going to use that to evaluate the cost function. In this case, it would be the mean value of the Ising and Newtonian. And then we're going to use uh, com like classical com computational power to, to optimize those, those parameters. So U is parameterized by a set of parameters now. And then we do that as a loop and we, we uh, increment, we, we versionally uh, change theta so that at the end we have this optimal state or optimal U uh, to solve our problem. So the general idea is that we are limited in this, this unitary that we can implement. So we take what we can and we, we parameterize it with a series of parameters. We optimize those parameters so that we get the best of what we, we, uh, we have. Uh, that we can implement on our disk devices. Okay, so in that case, we are not talking about finding the exact solution anymore. We will be talking about finding approximate solution for the people. So before, if we would do this at the perfectly adiabatic approach, we will end up with a single basis state. We will just measure once or a few times and get the solution. Here we have this psi of theta that will represent a finite distribution function over the classical variable and hopefully it has high probability for the good solution. So one of the most uh, studied uh, of these version approaches so far is what is known as a quantum approximate optimization algorithm or known as a QAOA. What QAOA is is simply uh, you know, kind of the recipe of what quantum ANZAS you should use, what is the form of it. And what it proposes is that uh, to implement kind of uh, quench dynamics, uh, alternative dynamics between this HP, which was this kind of uh, strong magnetic field along X, and this H Ising. So if you implement, for example, like uh, quench dynamics and you alternative, alternate because between those two Hamiltonian, and the time that, the duration that you apply each of those Hamiltonian, in that case, plays the role of diversional uh, parameters. So, uh, the beauty of this, this approach is that uh, even if you apply this, this uh, alternative uh, 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 Hamilton, like unitary is only once, so just two times the HB, one HB and one H Ising, you can already show that for, uh, for sparse matrices that you have uh, your output state, you can find optimal uh, parameters so that your output state has a finite probability uh, to uh, that you can sample the best solution. So it has a lower bound on the quality of its solution. And we also know that since you are implementing this HIZing on your platform, if you could do this an infinite amount of time, this, this uh, alternative quench dynamic, you will recover the adiabatic limit where you can find exactly the, the, the ground state, so the, the exact solution of the people. So that comes with a price, obviously. You still need to implement this HIZing. And if the topology of your Kubo problem, so for example, like a fully connected, does not fit the connectivity of your platform, here is the example of the Google Sycamore chip, then you need to do a lot of work uh, to map uh, this problem over your, your, uh, your, your quantum chip. And that needs, that can require a very deep circuit. And this, the depth of the circuit will scale as a number of, of qubit increases. So for example, the, the, the first talk of this uh, webinar series was given by Matthew Arrington from the Google team, and he presented uh, very well those, those challenges, and he, he showed that for three layers of, of this QAOA, 
using 17 qubit, you already need to have 2,000 single qubit gates and more than 1,200 1, two qubit gates to map this fully connected on there. So that's a challenge. So what you could do, if you cannot do that, you can say, okay, I cannot implement a super deep circuit. I cannot implement h -ising. What is left for us? Well, it is this kind of what is known as the R-way efficient ANSAS. So the idea here is that the unitary evolution that you implement has nothing to do with the, the problem in hand. You just do something that is simple to implement. So the only, only motivation here is that you implement something that you can. So usually, like the form is that you will have like nearest neighbor two, uh, uh, two qubit gates, so like C naught gates, for example, here. And you will have a layer of single rotation on your qubit. And the angle at which you rotate your qubit play the role of your variational parameters. Okay, so but in that case, now you do not uh, implement the, um, you know, the Hamiltonian of your system, so there are no guarantee that you can actually search the Hilbert space in an efficient way. You are kind of losing the power of quantum mechanics a bit here because you cannot implement the Hamiltonian. Uh, okay, one of the things that was nice with it is that you could, it's a simple ANSAS and you can have analytic expression for the gradient so that could maybe help you search the Hilbert space. But in 2018, uh, the Google team showed that uh, the problem is that your energy landscape of your cost function becomes exponentially flat as the number of qubit increases and as the depth of your layer increases, which means that those approaches uh, for our way efficient uh, are usually limited to very shallow and narrow circuit. Okay, so as kind of a recap, the problem of having a lot of qubit is it's kind of threefold. So the first thing is, okay, it's the, in, like the sheer engineering challenges to, to scale up with, with good quality hardware. Uh, but even though if we could have uh, bigger chips, uh, we would still struggle to, to implement this h -ising. It will require a very deep circuit and a lot of controls. That's very difficult, and that scales with the problem size. And if we throw that away, then the up, the hardware efficient uh, ANSAS becomes exponentially hard to optimize as the problem size increases. So the question is, can we find different encoding uh, scheme to solve uh, the, the Kubo uh, problem using fewer qubits? And if we can, can we find efficient optimization protocols? So for the rest of this, this talk, that's the question that I will be exploring. Okay. And I will, uh, in, in this context, I will propose an encoding scheme uh, that could allow us to solve Kubo problems using a number of qubit that scales uh, logarithmically with the, the number of classical variable. So in this context, the quantum states still re represent a, a distribution function over the classical uh, solution. And what we're going to show is that we can, uh, in, in these encodings, we can uh, ensure that the quantum state can capture systematically increasing the amount of correlations between the classical variable by uh, progressively increasing the number of qubits. So what I mean by that is that we, could, uh, we can implement a quantum state that can capture two body correlations, three body correlations, four body correlations by uh, increasing the number of qubits, for example. And two body correlation would mean that uh, given that I sample my first classical variable as zero, what is the probability to sample my fourth or fifth uh, classical variable as a one, for example? And three body correlation would be the same. If I sample a zero as my first classical variable and a, and a, and a zero at the fifth one, what is the probability to sample like a one for the, the ninth classical variable? Okay, so that's what, what we mean here. So I I would first kind of show this idea by looking at the, the trivial or the simplest limit where my quantum state can only describe statistically independent variable. Uh, in that case, uh, I will give an example of solving a dense Kubo problem that has 64 classical variable where I would just use seven qubit for that. So if you follow the scaling, you could solve these 10 to the, you could in principle be able to tackle the 10 to the four Kubo problem using like all, only 15 qubit. After I will show like a specific example of how we can encode these two body correlations in the quantum state. And I will uh, apply it to an example of a sparse matrix, a max cut problem with 42 classical variable using eight qubit. And more importantly, I will show that we get a gain compared to the 
a statistically independent variable. And lastly, I will finish by presenting a general framework uh, for extending it to multi-body correlations. Um, Mark, just a quick, uh, yeah. quick question to let you uh, maybe breathe for a second. Can you go back to the previous slide? The, the correlation. Uh, you mentioned, you defined what the correlation is. Can you give us an example in terms of the original problem you said about the facility location allocation problem? Yeah, so I, ne next slide I will talk more about it. Okay, uh, all right. Okay. Uh, okay, so here. So okay. I, I, will, I will take a minute to, to describe this. This is a, a, a key concept in, in this work, like correlations between classical variables. Uh, so, in the Kubo problems in general, uh, the classical variables are highly correlated and that's what makes it difficult to, to solve. Okay, so for example, if I have a, a vector X here uh, that has a given energy, uh, like so point 0.1, for example, let's say that I flip the last variable from one to zero, I could see an increase in the energy, for example. Okay, now if I do the same thing, but I have a different bit string here, so these are ones, okay, so then I have u, but I do the same thing, I flip the last, last classical variable, this time I can see like a decrease in the energy. So what it means is that, you know, the, 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 this variable here is correlated with the rest, okay, in the sense that if I flip it, the change in the energy depends on the configuration of the other classical variable. And this is what I mean by uh, correlations, okay, the, the, the classical variable are correlated. And Oops. if you have a system, if you so have a the, system that is, go ahead. So in the picture of the location, facility location, putting a facility somewhere or not, zero and one, correlates with having another one somewhere else, basically, or not. Exactly. So, so like, if the question like, okay, is it good to have this factory at this point? Well, it depends where the other factories are. So if it, the, the answer will depend on where the other factories are. And that's, that's a correlation, they are correlated. Here. And then if you have like this fully connected, you can, you can expect, expect that all your classical variable will be correlated to one another. Okay, so this is what we mean by correlation in a Kubo problem. What it means in terms of, of distribution function captured by my quantum state, it means the same thing. It means that the probability, I, I should be able to capture, like for example, the probability of, of sampling this X should be high, it's a good, it's a good solution. The probability of sampling Y should be low, it's a bad solution. And then I should be able to capture also the other way around with this U and V. And then if I can capture that, it means that I, I was able to capture those correlation in my, my quantum state. In contrast, if my quantum state could only capture classic, uh, statistically independent variable, then flipping the last variable here will lead to the same change in my probability in the two boxes. So I will not be able to, to capture the fact that flipping my last classical variable is good in one situation and is bad in another situation. It would just give me the same change. So in that case, I could not capture the correlation. So these are the concepts that we will be playing with and, and, and using for the rest. Hopefully it's, it's clear. Uh, okay, so let me quickly go back to what we have been discussing so far with like the quantum annealing. So this is what we will be, uh, 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 denoting as the complete encoding. So again, the number of each classical variable is mapped on a single qubit. So like a single classical uh, graph here uh, configuration can be represented by a single uh, basis state. And if I have like a universal uh, circuit, so these alpha, these probabilities are in principle, can be in principle all uh, independent up to a normalization factor. And in the light of the previous slide, it means that I can capture all correlation. So I can assign a specific, a, a unique probability to each of my solution X that takes into account the whole configuration. And the other good things about this encoding is that my cost function had the form of a mean value of the Hamiltonian. So I could in principle uh, implement this Hamiltonian to, to uh, utilize the adiabatic uh, theorem. So now let's jump to the other limit, and this is where our kind of encoding schemes kicks in. Okay, so let's consider the, the, the situation where we cut down the number of qubit extremely, and we look at the a logarithmic, uh, uh, log logarithmic amount of qubit. Okay, more precisely, one plus log nc, nc the number of classical variables. 
So here we divide our number of qubit into one ancilla and, and, and the log two uh, number of register qubit. And the idea is that we're gonna map not the whole the graph on a, a basis states, but each uh, classical variable on the basis states of my register. Okay, so for example, here I would need uh, three qubits, for example, I can give here, I would need three qubits to map this eight classical variables. So like my basis say zero, zero, zero could, could fit, could, could map on, on this classical variable, zero, zero, one, this one, and so on. Okay, so my register state, so my register basis states would be attached to a single classical variable in this case. And the, the ancilla, the state of the ancilla that would be in front in my quantum state tells me the probability for this classical variable to be either zero or one. So here I wrote this quantum state. It's a very general quantum state. I didn't do any uh, approximation or any, there's nothing there, it's very general. And, and so my ancilla qubit would be highly, highly entangled with my, my uh, register qubits. So for each uh, basis state, I have a different state and the different state tells me what is the probability of my classical variable. So uh, yeah, it's, in that case, every single classical variable is mapped on the, on the basis state and my ancilla gives me the probability. So for example, if I have such term in my Hamiltonian, that would mean that this classical variable has 50% chance to be zero and 50% chance to be one. And for example, if I have this term in my quantum state, it means that this variable is 100% chance to be one. And then I have a linear superposition of all those variables to tell me what is the probability for each. So this is the limiting case. It's a very trivial case where my quantum state can only describe a statistically independent classical variable. So it can only tell me what is the probability for this one to be zero and one, and dependently of the value of the others. So um, just a quick point, because this is, this is key, on the point on the previous slide. So basically now with above, you had nine variables, and you use three qubits, right? So, um, sorry, eight variables, and you and you use three qubits to encode them. That's the, that's the way where the comprehension comes, basically, the efficient encoding, sorry. right? Yeah, so you have eight variable, you need three qubits for right. the register and one qubit for the answer. Two qubit, right. uh, one qubit for the answer. Yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, so now let's go back to the cost function. So again, we start with the cost function of the Kubo problem here. Uh, now we're talking with quantum mechanics, so it needs to be uh, generalized to this sum over the probability distribution over X. That's nothing special to this encoding. But now we have a statistically independent, statistically independent uh, variable, which means that we can write it in the very simple form of saying, what is the probability of this classical variable to be one times the probability of this classical variable to be one and the energy. So it's, it's a very simple, simplistic way of writing it. And that comes from the fact that our quantum state uh, captures static independent classical variable. So in terms of what would you measure in, a, in an experiment? So the expression becomes a bit ugly. I will walk you through it. So it means that you will need to measure uh, uh, projectors. Okay, so here this P would mean this is a projector on a given basis state of my register qubit. And this P1 is the same projector, but now uh, with the ancilla qubit to be in the one. And the mean values uh, just represent that uh, I'm looking at the mean value of this P giving like the quantum state, rational quantum state phi one. So uh, the key point about this, this, this cost function is, okay, first the sanity check. So the minimum of this cost function represent the quantum state. You, the minimum of this, this, uh, the, the, this uh, cost function represents the quantum state that represent unit like 100% probability of the perfect solution of the Kubo. Okay, so if my quantum state represents the Kubo, the exact Kubo solution, it will be the minimum of this cost function. So that's a sanity check. We have, we have the same minimum. If I minimize this cost function, I find the exact solution of the Kubo problem. Uh, I can use only partial tomography to, to estimate it. So I, can, I need only to measure in the Z basis. Okay, that's that's a, a gain. But the most important thing is that it's a nonlinear function of expectation values. So I cannot write it down as a mean, as an expectation value of an Hamiltonian. I cannot map the, prob the Kubo problem on an Hamiltonian this time in this encoding. And that's a big deal. Okay, so how now do we 
you know, that we optimize this quantum state. So initially we had this complete encoding, we had this very large hyperspace, we had this quantum that was a mean value, we could use QAOA, are we efficient? Okay, we had the possibility to use that. Now I have a very, very small Hilbert space, a, a exponentially smaller Hilbert space, but now my cost function cannot be cast as a mean value of h, so I don't have any way to encode, to, to implement any QAOA or, or adiabatic uh, uh, quantum computing. So I, I just need what's left for the moment is are we efficient? So that's what we do. But here we have an exponentially small Hilbert space, which should be easier to look into. So what we do, we, we have this NSAS now, uh, this is uh, our way efficient and that's so we have this single layer of uh, c naught like two body uh, two qubit uh, gates nearest neighbor two qubit gates and we have this layer of rotation along y we only use y so that the output state has only real amplitude because our cost function do not depend on any phases so that's a way to kind of restrict the Hilbert space so that is kind of one layer and then we apply many layer of them um, in terms of the Kubo problem, it's, it's equivalent of now uh, looking at every single classical variable independently. I'm gonna flip one, I'm gonna flip this one and see if I increase or decrease the energy. So we don't expect it to be ex like extremely, like to scale really well because the searching approach is not very efficient. So the first result I'm gonna show here is, is this uh, theoretical limit of how does it scale as the problem size increases. So here from blue to uh, green, I show a problem of eight classical variable, 32 and 64, using four, six, and seven qubit respectively. So here it's the extreme limit, the, the theoretical limit. We have used infinite number of measurements every time that we uh, measure the cost function. And we use uh, 5,000 evaluation of the function. So 5,000 times we, uh, we change the variational. Yes. Mark, maybe off the video yes. because it's lagging again. Uh, okay, so we here uh, use 5,000 uh, uh, evaluation, which means that we, we uh, change 5,000 times the variational. So this is not the kind of number you would see in a quantum experiment. So I'm just showing kind of the, the theoretical limit on how it scales. And as expected, it's getting harder and harder to train as the, the, the problem size increases. And here we consider like a fully connected random instances, so one of the artists to solve, everybody talks to everybody. We use 20 different starting points, so like the initial uh, uh, angles, the initial parameters, uh, we randomly select them 20 times, that's why we have a mean value, this is the line, and the shaded region represent uh, plus minus one standard deviation. Uh, if we cut down, if we look at like one point here, so for L equal four, like four layer for the smallest problem, 12 layer and 18 layer for the other, I can show like different example of the training. This time we consider a more realistic setup where we have finite number of measurements, so 1000 measurement every time we look at the cost function, 5000 and so on. And again, it has the same, it, it scales the same, it's getting harder and harder to, to train as the, the problem size increases. Uh, so, Mark, Mark, just a quick um, question here. What do you mean by training here? And the other thing, what is the uh, you know, state of the art in, you say that you take the infinite amount of uh, measurements, means the perfect experiment that you can measure many times, or 5,000 or 10,000, how does it compare to uh, yeah. what experiments okay, so, Okay, so training might be a, a bad word to use. Uh, I'm talking about optimization. So we, we want to optimize our quantum state so that it minimizes the cost function. So we're gonna change the variational parameter uh, until the, the cost function is minimum. So this is the value of the, the cost function. And this is like the parameter that are changed. So it's an optimization process, not necessarily a training process. Okay. In terms of state of the art, so we've been seeing with the, the talk from, from, uh, from Matthew in, in the Google that uh, you know, they can go up to, so they, usually you can think of like being able to do uh, like a 5,000 measurement uh, a second and, and you can go up in, in the millions of measurement for, for like 10 to the six measurement for uh, like a given experiment. So in, the, in this case, if, we, if you look at the number of evaluation and the number of measurement, we are definitely in what is doable right now. Mm -hmm. These experiments are, are uh, above the present state of the art, like 15,000. This is more than what we can do for the moment, but we can expect that in the future. Right. So I wanted, I wanted to clarify this.
Yeah, it's good to <clears throat> clarify these two points to the audience that this is an optimization thing that we are doing. It's not exactly training. We're not doing machine learning here. It's just that uh, yeah, the terminology might be confusing. So thanks for clarifying. Sure. So the, the last thing is that, okay, now we have this optimal quantum state uh, in N. Uh, we can uh, extract the solution of it. We can, we can extract the, 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 you know, the zeros and ones and see if they are good solutions of our Kubo problem. So again, so this is for increasing uh, uh, problem size. So the way to read those graphs is that if I pick up a point here, for example, it means that I have 30% of my solution that I've drawn that has energy higher than 0.1. Okay, so this is here I have uh, uh, renormalized energy that goes from zero to one. One is the worst solution, zero is the exact solution. So for infinite measurement, you can see, for example, by this line that almost 80% of my, my solution drawn are the exact one. Okay, and the same here, like this gap is exactly the number of exact, but for finite measurement as a number of solution, the, 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 the system size increases, uh, we do not find the exact solution anymore. And this is, these lines are kind of, what is the best solution? The point here is that the black dot line is what would be, uh, what you would get if you have just random guess. Okay, so if you, you don't do anything, you have a random guess, you will follow the black lines. So, you know, luckily we beat by far the random, uh, random guess, uh, but it's, get, it's getting harder and harder to train as a number of, of uh, variables. So just to give you an idea, for 64 variable, we are talking about two to the 64 possible solution. So this is huge. It's, it cannot be done on my computer, for example. Okay, so that's mostly yeah, this. this is, this is very important to clarify here because we're using different numbers. Uh, you know, and also the, the notion of infinite measurements for any experiments in the audience might be, we mean full tomography here, whatever the size of the system. And secondly, yes, it does scale. It does not um, converge very good at 64, but it can actually solve at this level, um, you know, quite, quite big problems. So, so it's basically a classical computer optimization problem which just takes too long to to do it so yeah just just a point so full tomography sometimes refers to having to uh, know the phases here we don't do that yeah this is only amplitude so it's actually easier that's a good point it's, it's partial, easier than full tomography we only look at the probabilities but uh, um, uh, yeah so, the, size so the, of the, the, the the dark line here is for infinite measurement and the other is for the finite measurement Okay, so just one last thing about this, and after I will move on to the two qubit, uh, to the two body correlations. So uh, just a quick comparison with the complete encoding and, and the minimal encoding, which is what I just described. So the, the level of, of uh, expressivity that I can get with my quantum state is the same as if I had the complete encoding, so the number of classical variables is equal to the number of qubit, and I do just a simple a single layer of single qubit rotation. That would be the same as, you know, uh, just looking at zeros and ones for each variable independently. So what I've been showing is kind of uh, already, I think very interesting of the question of what does it take to take this very simple, but wide, very shallow, but wide circuit and map it onto a, a very thinner circuit, but deeper. What is the type of, of resources that it takes? And that's kind of what I answered. For the people that are more into classical machine learning, uh, the, the expressibility that my quantum state gives me is very trivial. It's equivalent of a classical Boltzmann machine with no hidden layer. So it's very simple. Uh, but that was the first step. Okay, so this is the first step. We take this very simple uh, quantum state that will only tell me about classically, like statistically independent variable. What is the next step? How can I start to encode two-body correlations between classical variables? So the way to do that is, again, we break down the number of qubits, but this time we have two qubit and scylla, and we have log two and pair uh, register qubit. And the n pair is the number of pair of variable that I will uh, encode. Let me be clearer with that. So what it means that, let's say that I use this kind of uh, sparse uh, uh, graph. I could choose to say, I will encode the correlation, so like the, uh, probability of x3, x5, for example, what is the probability of 
x3 to be zero if x5 is one. For example, this is a type of correlation I can encode. So I could encode only the lines, the correlation between those classical variables. So in that case, it will give me 12 edges, so 12 pair, and my number of, of register uh, qubit would be log 212. Okay, so here I give an example. Let's say I do that, I encode only those pairs, so only those edges. I, I would need four uh, qubit for my register, and I could map saying, okay, my quantum state 000 can be related to this pair of variable, 0001 to this pair of variable, and so on. So each of my basis states now do not point towards a single classical variables, it points toward a pair of single variable, of, of uh, classical variables. And the quantum state adopts the same exact form. We have a pointer. This is the register qubit, okay, the register quant uh, basis states. It points to pairs. And now I have two qubit as the insula. That gives me the probability, for example, to be one, one. What is the probability to be one, zero for my classical variable, probability being zero, one, and so on. It gives me all the probability for my different pair. So again, as an example, if I had such term in my quantum state, that would mean like 0, 1, 0, 1 here, I define it as the pair x1, x2. And it would mean that I have 50% chance this pair to be 0, 0, and 50% chance to be 1, 1. Okay, so that allows me to encode this correlation, so like these kind of uh, uh, conditional probabilities between my classical variables. And this quantum state is very general in the sense that I can choose which pair I encode. It will change the number of qubit I need, but I can, I can choose which one I encode. It's a choice that I have. So this slide is about this point, so I can choose which pair to encode. And for example, if I have a sparse problem, so this is my sparse problem in max cup, I could choose to do a sparse encoding. I could say, okay, intuitively, the correlations between the classical variables that are connected might be more important, might be more dominant to solve the problem. So I can encode only those. And I can only say, I will say, okay, I encode the correlation between x1, x2, I encode the correlation between x2, x3, but I will not encode the correlation between x2, x8, for example. In that case, the number of qubit that I need would be the same as the minimal encoding plus log 2d, where like this is a, a d regular graph that would be log 2d number of qubit, additional qubit I need. If I have a dense problem, like everybody talks to everybody, then there's no structure in it. So it's, it becomes very arbitrary of what type of, of pair that I choose. The only unbiased choice would be to encode all pairs. Okay, so like all the lines are encoded. And in that case, it takes me much more qubit to do that, but I can encode all pairs if I want. Okay, so that's kind of a choice and it, it's a big deal. Like when you do this, this protocol, you need to wisely choose which pair you will encode. Okay, so, uh, I, I will spare you a lot of details. There's, it's more tricky than the, the statistically independent. I will go through quickly uh, the procedure, uh, but if you are more interested about the details, the paper will be out soon uh, next week. Uh, so one of the challenge is that the probability, when you work with this kind of quantum state now that encodes two body correlation, is that the probability to sample a classical solution is not unique. Okay, so for example, I could say, what is the probability to uh, to sample a given solution, I could insert this question in a different ways. I could say, I could look at only those pairs. So the probability of sample X would be, what is the probability of this pair multiplied by the probability of this pair and so on. That's, that's what is known as a perfect matching. I can also answer the same question differently by looking at different pairs. And those two answers could be very different. Okay, so the probability of sampling a classical solution is not uniquely defined with this type of quantum state. So if we want to uh, derive a cost function that is well behaved and let us do the optimization protocol, we need to average over the probabilities. We need to say, what is the average probability? What is average correlations? We need to average over all uh, the different uh, uh, perfect matching. But again, if you are interested in the details, we can talk after or you can look at the paper. Uh, it would be a bit cumbersome to go through all the details. Uh, I can just say that to do this averaging, uh, we can only do it in the exact way when we consider all encode, like all to all, uh, like all the edges. Otherwise, we need to resort to approximations. Okay, if we do that, we can define a cost function again. So we start with the same thing. But now we have uh, 
you know, these conditional probabilities of having one, one, and we need to do the averaging and we end up with a cost function that is well behaved, but there's more uh, kind of classical uh, overhead to do with the measurements. Okay. Uh, again, we need to do the sanity check. We need to make sure that the quantum state that minimizes this, this, this cost function represent exactly the, the, the best solution of the Kubo problem, it does. Okay, so if we minimize perfectly this quantum state, we will find exactly the, the, the exact solution of the Kubo problem. We again only you need to make measurement in the Z basis. And finally, this is a, again a nonlinear function of expectation value. So it cannot be cast as a mean value of the Hamiltonian, the same as before. I'm not going to show the exact expression in terms of measurement. It's, it's much more involving. Okay, one last thing, and after I show the results. So once we, we have the quantum state that is optimized, the best quantum state, how do we sample this string? How do we sample the Kubo solution? Again, it's a bit more tricky. There are different ways of doing this. The way we do that is that we pick a pair. We sample the value. So let's say that these are the value, like, what is the, the probability of being 0, 0, 1, 0, and so on. So this here and is an example where it's highly probable to sample 1, 1. We sample from it, we get, for example, 1, 1. Now we know that this is a 1, so we can, it can affect what is the probability to, to see x a and x2. So I have here, I have conditional probabilities encoded. So the fact that I have sample 1 will affect these new variable. And I can use that to renormalize all my probabilities. Okay, so it's a bit tricky, but what it means is that my, in my measure, in my sampling protocol, uh, I can utilize, I can exploit these correlations to do a more efficient, uh, to, to, to do a sampling that will really use all these correlations. And it can also induce new correlations. So for example, if I measure this as being one, so if I sample this as being one, then the probability of sampling X7 would have been would have changed, okay, because of this this chain rule. And initially, I had I didn't not I did not encode this correlation, so this is kind of an induced correlation. These are again details, but this is things that you need to think of when you implement those those protocols. Okay, now these are the results. Uh, so this is for a max cut problem with 42 variable. So this is just an example of eight. You can imagine that it's a much bigger problem. Uh, so it's a D, it's a three regular max cut problem with 42 variable. Here I compare the two body correlation quantum state, the green line, to the statistically independent uh, limit, which is the red line. Okay. These are two different cost functions, the, the one that I showed. So this is for infinite measurement and that as a function of the circuit depth, it shows that like, okay, uh, you need deeper circuit to get better results. This is an example uh, for, uh, I forgot to write it, it's L equals six, yeah, here. So this is for L equals six. And now we have finite measurements, so we compare 10,000 measurements, and we need this kind of you know, number of evaluation. So this is really in what we could expect to be able to see in, in future experiments. Okay, and so we, we see that this is for the, the two qubit, the two body correlation, and this is for the one body correlation. But the most important thing is here is what is the quality of the, the solution that can be sampled from it? And we see that by using the two-body correlation, these are the two lines, we have a substantial gain over the one-body correlation, like the no correlations. Okay, so by encoding the two-body correlations in our quantum state and optimizing it, when we sample a solution, Kubo solution, we get better solution out of it. Despite the fact that we need a bit more qubit and that the classical overhead of, calculate, of, of interpreting the result is a bit higher, we still get a gain and it's a substantial gain. Okay, so that's, so here the conclusion is that if we do it properly, if we encode the correlation, we can actually have more information in the quantum state and be more efficient to solve the problem. As a, a comparison, like let's say that I have a fully connected graph. Here it's only eight, so this is the exact example I'm solving then things get a bit harder. I need to implement all the pairs, or I, I, I did implement all the pairs. So all the lines are encoded. And in that case, the number of qubit I need is much higher. This is, I need eight qubits to do, uh, seven qubits to do it. And the overhead is, is, is become, becoming a bit too much so that optimizing it is not efficient. 
and I cannot beat the, the minimal encoding limit. Okay, so the conclusion is that when you have sparse matrices, you can uh, smartly choose which pair to encode, and that allows to be efficient and, and to, to have an efficient encoding. Okay, so this is my last slide, and after we're done, uh, we can generally, we can easily generalize this to multi body correlation. So now the idea is that if you want to include three body, four body, or five body correlations, you need to use three, four, and five ancilla qubit. Uh, again, there are always the choices. What groups are you encoding? So, for example, you could encode uh, you know, a disconnected group. So, in that case, it would be a four-body correlation. So, four and Scylla. And I would, I would need two groups, for example, in that case. Uh, so, if you do that, you can, you can think of your Kubo problem. You solve, you partition your Kubo problem, and you solve them in parallel. Uh, and, and, and you get, so, and you use kind of the full encoding for each subgroup. So like you need four qubit for that, four qubit for that. You could also do the same, say, okay, each of my node talks to three other guys. So this is a, like a group of four. I'm gonna encode this group and I'm and go encode each group that is centered on classical variables. So that will need more register qubit. And you can also do the other extreme that I will encode all the groups. Okay, so uh, the point of this slide is that you can generalize this to multi-body correlation. If you do that, you will be faced uh, the question like which group I will encode. And, and this choice would be very important. It will tell you if you can implement an efficient protocol and if you get efficient uh, probability. So uh, this is where we are a bit right now. We are looking at how can we scale that? How can we go higher in correlations and, and solve like the uh, deregular max cut or fully connected group and, and how does it help? Is, is there a tilting point where uh, we can start to have enough correlations to get very, very uh, good solution? Okay, so that's my conclusion. Uh, the, the important point maybe is are the next steps. So the key point here is that when we were looking at these different encoding schemes, uh, we couldn't write an Hamiltonian, so we had to use the R-way efficient. So the next step for us is to uh, start looking at, is there kind of hybrid approaches where we can use these, these uh, efficient encoding, but still uh, try to map it on Hamiltonian and use kind of QAOA machine use and stuff like that. And also we want at some point to uh, implement this on a quantum model. This is our next step. And on that, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, um, Vichyo Klapp, uh, Mark. Uh, the, we have time for questions, points, comments. Uh, you can also write over, what is the chat this year? Um, or unmute yourselves and ask if you want. I want, while you, people are thinking, I have one more here at the end. So, so overall, basically, if you have the, um, what, what we call minimal encoding, so um, how does this compare? I think a general question from the others could be, how does this compare to what's out there at the moment? So, um, so the, so the, the minimal encoding is, is very trivial. It's the trivial limit. So like classically, like I said, it would mean uh, you do some machine learning approach using a Boltzmann machine with no hidden variable. So it's very basic. So it's not sure. something that would compete uh, with classical approaches. Mm -hmm. so, so what well, do we expect? Yeah, what are, the, what are the, you know, in terms of numbers, we said you mentioned in the beginning 10,000 um, variables, right? Ah, so there is a question from Larul as well. So, um, so let me just finish this point. So 10,000 variables is the classical, roughly where the normal problems appear. Um, with our approach, you will require in that case, how many qubits? 15 qubits. For the one five, 15 qubits. 15 yeah, qubits five. to capture certain instances of problems that do not have correlations. This is, this is the minimal encoded case, right? 
you can capture every the the dense the most complicated problem but no correlation. No so correlation. You could implement, so so it's I think it's very interesting to just like as a, if you have 15 qubit you can look at it. The guess is that uh, uh, the the training the, the optimization protocol might be a bit different. I can, you, I can, we 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 missed you I, there again actually. Okay, I, I, I can stop the video again. Can you say uh, the last bit again? Yeah. Yeah, so you could use 15 qubit. It would be very interesting to, to uh, as proof and principle, to look at it, to, to try to solve these very large problem. The optimization process might be very difficult. And, and, but, but in the classical of optimization, qubit, the classical algorithm, like using no, no, the, the, optimization, the optimization protocol that I presented would be difficult if, if you look at these large problems. Because it's, you, you have a two to the whatever. Um, to, to the two 20. To the 10 to the 4. Two to yes. the 10 to the 4. So the so. classical part will get hard. We have a question from Rahul, actually. Rahul Jane from Go also, also PI at CQT. He asks, can we do something efficient using classical algorithms for sparse graphs? Rahul, you can also yes. unmute your mic if you want to join there. So actually, my, yeah, my question is uh, as follows. So, uh, so, so broadly speaking, uh, the way I understand it, what he was uh, trying, uh, saying here is that if we have like a sparse graph, right, then you can do something more efficient, right, to, to optimize, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think there are, there are, uh, there are plenty of approaches, uh, classical approaches that do look especially at sparse graphs. Uh, that, that can be more efficient for like the regular graph. Uh, yeah, yeah. So same as also QAOA and the quantum version, it's, it's more efficient talking about a sparse graph. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand, a, for example, you know, if we take 3SAT or anything, and I mean, 3SAT with even very sparse set of constraints uh, already becomes very difficult to optimize. So I am just trying to understand uh, you know, for example, for this cubo cases, let's say quadratic optimization, uh, you know, the, the thing is that, you know, uh, with very sparse graphs, right, like even with a, just a circle or something, right? I mm -hmm. mean, the dependencies between variables quickly come in. I mean, and as, as, yes. uh, as soon as the graph is connected, right, it, it could be yep. sparse, but a connected graph. Now, as soon as the graph is connected, uh, already, uh, uh, you know, dependencies start to kick in. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I, I'm just trying to understand how, how, what, what, uh, what kind of optimal, just classically speaking, I mean, even uh, not considering anything quantum, even just classical algorithms, uh, how do they bring in any kind of efficiency with sparse graphs? Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's a good question. I actually, uh, I'm not in a very good position to, uh, describe in details the classical approaches. I'm not uh, that much of an expert in the sense that how can it be used to uh, uh, exploit the fact that it's sparse. At this stage, I can only say that uh, I'm aware that there are approaches that are more suited for sparse uh, graph, but uh, that's kind of the extent that I can answer this question. Like, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. Sure about so yeah, so so that's what I'm saying. So if if there are uh, classical algorithms that that you know somehow work better for sparse graphs, then, then it provides hope uh, for, for similar quantum uh, approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the, the key here is really is like, uh, we want to kind of build up uh, uh, step by step on the quantum approaches and see if we can, you know, if, if first in, uh, increasing the amount of correlations helps and, and if we can do it efficiently. So for sure, if we compare to the classical approaches, it's, it's, a, it's a hard fight. To win at this stage. So uh, the first thing to, to be looked at is within the quantum world, can we kind of make it better and can we kind of scale up? Uh, yeah. So and after like comparing to the no, no, no I, I understand. I understand. So, but but uh, but uh, even uh, within the quantum uh, quantum uh, ap approaches, right? When we are looking at this uh, uh, this idea of uh, trying to attack sparse graph first, right? Um, uh, see, so one thing that I understand is that basically instead of exploring through all possible distributions, you're only trying to explore through uh, either independent distributions or two wise independent or three wise independent and so on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, you know, if a, for class, you know, as, as such, the, the, the optimal distribution 
uh, is a single point distribution, which is which is actually uh, n wise independent, right? So yeah. So even uh, you know uh, even exploring through n wise independent distributions is already hard. So it is. Um, so uh, yeah. Anyways, yeah. So the thing, the n wise usually you can use these these uh, quantum annealing approaches, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so if I may jump in, so in, the quantum annealing approaches are good in like um, theoretically and so on. They would always work as long as you could a implement the Hamiltonian and b go slow and go and find the ground state. And these are the two bottlenecks I had with wise. Otherwise, quantum and would Adam definitely. Cuba, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the, the quantum will always uh, uh, win. We have one more question from the audience, if, um, if I can uh, bring it in from Woodcash. Uh, number one, the optimization will perform in noise-free environment. And uh, two, capability of QAA to correct the correct result is problem dependent, no matter how much you increase your P. That's something similar happens here too. Um, so they repeat them, uh, Mark, the optimization will perform in noise-free environment. Okay, so, so the simulation we did are noise-free for the moment. So we have a finite measurement, but it's noise-free. Uh, for us, the next step would be to put it on, on an hardware and see how it, it performs with noise. Yes, and the second uh, question was about uh, capability of QAA to get the correct result is problem dependent no matter how much you increase your P. Does something similar happens here too? Uh, okay, so I'm not sure about this one. So uh, if, if P goes to infinity in principle, I can implement a perfect adiabatic uh, passage and then I could solve any problem. I'm not sure if that's the point. I think- uh, here, yeah. So here the link I can do in terms of problem dependent. So the point here is the choice of which correlations you encode. And so if you have a problem that has a particular symmetry, a particular topology, you can kind of utilize that as an intuition that will tell you like which correlation I should include. So it's more like an intuitive, like my, my, the type of problem I have can give me intuition of, of maybe which correlation I should uh, focus on, for example. But, but uh, if, I, if I may add, uh, when we get to the full equality, as we keep increasing this, we, we are, we're laying out the process here, you know, minimal, then one ancilla, two ancilla, three ancilla, gone. When you get to the full ancilla, you, are, you, can, you can encode everything, right? And in principle, uh, we have the full problem, like... like yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. So, so, we, so it's we a similar... We the full problem. Yeah, yeah. We yeah, so that's problem. actually, that's, that, that's a point that I haven't mentioned. Uh, exactly. So, if we if we increase the number of of ancilla, we do recover the full encoding limit. We do recover the limit where we can capture everything in a smooth way. There's a there's a way to do that. So our encoding captures that. I'm not sure if I answered properly the questions though, but uh, maybe you can re ask if there's anything. Yeah, I think I think it's probably okay. There's one more by Jun Juni Li. How exactly do you map the energy cost? For flipping a binary variable in an actual problem to probability that you store in the ancilla qubit. Oh, so so flipping a, a variable would just mean uh, flipping your ancilla qubit. It's the same. So like we'll say, let's say that my my uh, my ancilla qubit uh, points to an up, which like would uh, be uh, c as a zero, for example. Then flipping it would just be flipping this this uh, this uh, this states. But again, it's a, the, it's, it's a highly entangled state between ancilla and, and register. So it would flip the state of my ancilla uh, that is connected to, my, to, to, to this classical variable, so the, to, the, to the basis state of the register. But that, that's how I would capture it. You just change the state of your ancilla and that's uh, equivalent of flipping a classical variable. Hopefully that's that answer. Yeah, this is in the previous slide, but yeah, maybe it's okay. Uh, so in that uh, side, so that that would be like exactly thinking, yes. So it's like if I'm if I'm zero here, so this is one and this is zero, then flipping this classical variable with with you know changing from zero to one. But again, this is attached to a, a given register state here. You know, one more question by I've, I've sent it to you as well by Yang Glive from my HPC. It's about the two-body correlation. 
When evaluating the results of two body correlation, the choice of first pair to evaluate seems matter to matter the final results. Will this result yes. in different starting pair leads to different results? Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. I mean, you can put your questions to the to general guys. I'll put it on the everyone as well, so people can see. Okay, so actually, thank thank you for this question because I I couldn't go into the details. So what we did, uh, you're right. Like, if you depending on which pair you start with, you can you can you can find a different solution, and that's because this is non uniqueness of this this uh, probability of x. So what we do is that we the first pair we select it by asking the quantum state, which of the pair are you the most confident about? Okay, so like, for example, we will pick the pair that has the highest number, like whatever it, like is it, if there's one pair that the quantum, cell tell, quantum state tells me there's 100% chance that this is a zero, zero, like 100, or this is like a 90% chance that these are two ones. And it's the most certain one, we're gonna pick this. And the, just the, the idea, the, the intuition is that, okay, the quantum state is very certain about this pair. It should be very important, for example. So let's pick this one and start there. We could start randomly. We, we, we definitely tried and, and compared, and it's more robust if we start with the, the kind of the most certain pair every time. Yeah, so that's... Okay. I hope it Thanks, Mark. Any other questions? Okay, they seem, um, they seem not to be. Uh, thanks, Jan, Levy. Uh, I, I think it's uh, probably a good time to stop. Thank you all again for uh, joining us. Um, do feel free to reach out to, uh, to Mark or me uh, if you have more questions, especially with uh, some of you that we're already discussing a few things. Um, and um, see you next Friday with, um, I think it's Jens Eisert from Berlin, if I remember well. Um, remember it's at 4 p.m. and he will talk about certification of quantum devices. Thank you and bye-bye. <laughs>